Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the February 19th, 2019 Post Falls City Council uh, meeting. Uh, we started the evening with a workshop on bonds, which educated all of us. Um, the clerk will note that all council members, with the exception of Councillor Malloy, are present, and uh, Joe is excused tonight. Uh, ceremonies, announcements, appointments, and presentations. We do have a presentation, and I would like Caden, if I pronounce right, Olsenberg? Please come down front. It is always a pleasure to recognize the honor of those uh, scouts who have attained the rank of Eagle Scout. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm impressed because it's not that common, but we seem to see one so I, I love the fact that we have young men and, and actually we had a group that was honored as well uh, who are so, still so active in scouting and we want to thank you for all you do. But this is, this is Caden uh, Olsenberg, Olen, Olsenberg, I'm sorry, 213 Old Mission District. Caden has earned 28 merit badges and has served his troop in a variety of leadership roles. He has also completed a major community service project, the construction of a new 14-foot cross out in front of a local church. Caden organized a takedown and cleanup of the old cross, the fundraising for the materials and managing the crew of his fellow scouts, friends, and family members that helped build and place it. Caden is currently a senior at Post Falls High School and continue, uh, plans to continue his education at North Idaho College and the University of Idaho in order to obtain a career in computer science and gaming. So, Caden, on behalf of myself and City Council and Peoples Falls, we'd like to congratulate you on your achievement. And we have, who are you? A certificate acknowledging your achievement. And we have a gift card to Cabela's. We used to give a butt knife, and when I became mayor, they took that away because they thought I would be dangerous with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> Use that for whatever purpose you choose. So, congratulations. Congratulations, Caden. Good job, Caden. Congratulations, Caden. Nicely done. Good job. Can you tell me what church is it so I can go see it? I will go check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Caden. And thanks to Caden's family. Uh, we all know that we're all going to take credit when we have good kids it's because of parents. So can, good job. Yes. Um, also tonight, we have a request for reappointment of uh, Jason Cornwell, Howard Gold, and James Hale to the Parks and Recreation Commission. And at this point, I'd like to say we lost uh, the chairman of that commission. Uh, Rick Norton uh, passed away last week. Uh, his funeral was yesterday, so we will be bringing forward a name to replace Rick. But uh, we appreciate all the time and effort Rick contributed to the city of Pulse Falls, not only through the Park and Recreation Commission, but through everything else he did for the city, so he will definitely be missed. But, Council, I would ask for a confirmation vote on that. So moved. Second. Motion second. Further discussions? Shannon, please take the roll. Anthony? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Porters? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Oh, sorry. Is not here. Is not here. <laughs> Thank you. Motion passes. <laughs> Under announcements, Weinstein and Dine 2019 is next Saturday, March 2nd, at 7 p.m. at the Greyhound Park and Event Center. This annual event raises money for classrooms in the Post Falls School District. The evening includes over 85 wineries, microbreweries, and restaurants, a silent auction, live entertainment, and much more. Tickets are $45 and are available online at PFEF. WSD.org. <laughs> PFEFWSD.org. It's a great event. I had the opportunity to 
be involved in that when it first started. And uh, it has grown uh, exponentially and it benefits all the teachers and students in our local schools. I would also like to read a letter I received. Um, as you know, there was a, it sounds bad maybe, but a sex sting operation <laughs> where we caught bad guys. And I mean, yeah. these, these are bad guys. And so I received a letter today from uh, Barry McHugh, the prosecuting attorney for Kootenai County. Dear Ron, I would like to commend the city of Pulse Falls for its contribution to a recent joint operation targeting individuals predisposed to travel to engage in sexual activities with minors. The operation, titled Operation Lonely Heart, was a cooperative effort between federal, state, and local agencies. The Department of Homeland Security led the operation with assistance from the Idaho Attorney General's Internet Crimes Against Children uh, Task Force. The two-day operation resulted in five arrests, including one individual who is a local registered sex offender. Chief Pat Knight, Police Department Administration, Police Department staff, and city personnel were essential to the success of the operation. When Chief Knight was approached with the idea, he immediately said, whatever you need, we will make it happen. Chief Knight really understood the cooperative effort that it takes to complete a successful operation. The operation consisted of approximately 60 law enforcement officers, investigators, and federal agents. Participating agencies included Kootenai County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Idaho, the Washington State Patrol, Kootenai County Sheriff's Office, Coeur d'Alene's Police Department, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, U.S. Marshal Service, and U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Again, I would like to convey our appreciation and please let the council know that this operation could not have been a success without the help of the city of Post Falls. So, Chief, it's something we've come to expect of you and our police department, and from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for what you do to get some of these people off the streets. Yes. And I believe that is it on the announcements. Uh, are there any amendments to the uh, agenda tonight? Uh, we have one amendment we need to remove under consent calendar. Item E, Riverside Harbor Lift Station, a VISTA service agreement needs to be pulled from the agenda. Okay. Entertain a motion. I'd move to uh, have that item E removed from the consent agenda. Second. second. Motion second. Further discussion? Janet, please take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Orson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Would you like to present the consent calendar? Actually, I did ask, are there any declarations of conflict tonight? Seeing and now would you promote, uh, pr present the consent calendar? Item A is minutes from the February 5th, 2019 City Council meeting. Item B is payables January 29th through February 11th, 2019. Item C is approval for finance director to file budget hearing notification with Kootenai County Auditor. Item D is FiberLink service agreement with Intermax Networks to link the Post Falls Police Department and Kootenai County Data Center. Item F is request by the Police Department to send seven vehicles to auction. Item G is request by the Police Department to send various equipment to auction and to gift some equipment no longer in use to other 911 centers. Item H is request by the IT Department for the disposal of various computer equipment. And those items are, uh, we remove all the hard drives and everything from those before we send them. Are there any questions on consent calendar? I have just one quick question. I understand on the cars that there's an, you know, auto auction where you can send cars, but for all this equipment, where do you, where do we send it to auction? It's the, yeah, I'll let Please. Pat answer that. I can't I'm think of the name here. of the auction place right now. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, that's a good question. So until recently, we took most of our stuff out west, and now we have the two auction houses that we, we try to divvy between the two of them. we got Premier Auction, and then we have Rhineland Auction out west. So uh, we try to divvy up between the two, and to be fair, we have property that needs to go to auction. We'll send it out there. So. Oh, okay. So it's all here local. It's local here. Oh, okay. And Rhineland was the one that we used primarily before we had the two. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Love to entertain the motion. I'd move to approve the consent calendar as amended. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wilhelm? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Reporters? Aye. Corson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Tonight we have one public hearing, early dawn vacation. And with that, I will open the public hearing.
I'm sorry, I should, should announce, if anyone, wish, anyone wishes to testify in this public hearing, there are forms on the Diaz, please fill them out and turn them into our clerk and we will give you time to speak. Um, first, I want to say good evening, Mayor Jacobson, President Council Wilhelm and Council Members. My name is Jamie Hayes. I am Planner One with the Community Development Department and I am here to present the Early Dawn Right Away Vacation. It is not showing up on my screen. Thank you very much for that. Um, it is case file VACA-1-2019. The owner is Copper Basin Construction and the applicant is Drew Dittman. The requested action here is to review and approve the requested vacation for a portion of the early dawn or Bogey Drive location within the Tullamore subdivision. As you can see in the hatched red, that is the proposed uh, right away to be vacated. Here you have East Bogey Drive, which will eventually extend north, and Early Dawn, which terminates at the proposed vacation. In Exhibit A6 here shows the uh, proposed right away to be vacated. In Exhibit A7 shows the utility easement within the proposed vacation. As far as staff comments, the vacation has been requested due to the realignment and extension of Bogey Drive, which will eventually be the local public street that connects and extends northerly to Prairie Avenue. City staff does not have any issues regarding the proposed vacation request. The vacation will not have any impact on the utility services or existing or future lots. This is a zoomed out picture, so you can kind of get the overall idea of where this is and how this is going to be completed. And once again, you have Bogey Drive coming in, which will eventually extend all the way up and terminate at Prairie. You have Highway 41 right here, and then you have Early Dawn, which eventually terminates at the proposed vacation. These are all the agencies routed. As far as agency responses, a Vista Utility Corporation responded with a request to reserve public utilities within the defined vacation. And going back to Exhibit A7, you can see that the uh, proposed right of way will be have the, uh, the utilities preserved. Do you have any questions or comments? Questions of Jamie. Chief. Jamie, will there eventually then be other streets coming off of Bogey then? Off of Bogey, well, going back one to the to this one, yeah. you will see that it will intersect um, right here. That looks like that might be a street. So I mean, with whatever gets in, ends up getting developed through here, I don't think that there's going to be too much dendritic uh streets derived off of there but we could also get bill up here if you want to comment on any of the how the network is going to be connected <clears throat> so yeah as <clears throat> john manley planning manager here at the city so as bogey drive continues from which is here to the south and meanders and changes direction north south and intersects prairie you would have hope avenue which runs east west intersect with it um, also, you may even have some internal drive axes come off that as well. And as it proceeds further to the north, you would have a uh, kill deer that would intersect with it as well before it hits prairie. So there will be some intersections as it proceeds further to the north. Okay. Does that answer your... Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Jamie. Right, Is the uh, proponent wishing to speak tonight? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't see one. With that, I will close the public hearing. <coughs> Council, how would you like to act? There were, could you double check to make sure there weren't any new positive to speak? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I will reopen the public hearing. <laughs> Is there anybody wishing to speak on this topic? We have none. I'm sure glad I have people. <laughs> sure glad I have people to keep me alive. <laughs> I was, I was so surprised we didn't have a proponent. I forgot about the public comment after I announced it. Now I will reclose the public hearing. Council, thanks so. I had moved to approve uh, early dawn vacation file number VACA-001-2019. Second. second. Motion second for the discussion. Shannon, please take the roll. Porters? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you.
Next item up is unfinished business, and tonight it's the construction manager general contractor services agreement with McMillan Jacobs, Mac Jacobs for the outfall and river crossing. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Craig Bornpool, Utilities Manager. It's good to see you again. Um, I'm here to speak tonight about uh, an ongoing project, outfall and river crossing. And to be clear, we are seeking approval of a contract tonight with McMillan Jacobs, and I'll explain their role in this project right now. So key points, we are upgrading the uh, wastewater outfall and installing an underwater pipeline, which will lead to the community forest to be used for uh, reuse, connecting um, our facility to the community forest. And we're proposing to use a uh, construction manager general contractor for procurement um, or for uh, um, construction services for this. It's a different procurement method. And the big key for this one is it is reducing risk to the city. So to orient everyone, the uh, <clears throat> water reclamation facility is up here in this corner and our existing outfall in the Spokane River is uh, right where that marker is. So this project, um, to remind you, we are uh, replacing the outfall, which goes to about middle of the river. And then we're also, this is where we will extend the pipeline underneath the river over to the community forest area. So the construction manager, general contractor um, procurement method is a little different from a um, design bid build in that we involve a contractor earlier in the design process and allow them input on the design as it's moving forward. Um, so we have a contract with the uh, designer, with JUB engineers for the design. We're seeking approval to sign a contract with um, McMillan Jacobs for the construction manager general contractor. So CMGC, uh, their responsibilities in, in pre-construction, they're really looking at the constructability of the project. Again, looking to provide input earlier in the design process. Um, and that can impact things uh, such as permitting, phasing of the, uh, of the construction, manage the competitive bidding, um, looking at the scheduling. And again, trying to seek, um, trying to look for the variables which, which may be problematic for the project from a constructability standpoint and provide solutions to those early on rather than once we get into the middle of the river not knowing you know, the best way to go forward. Um, so as part of that contract, they'll develop a guaranteed maximum price. So again, it's different from the design bid build where you know, we would take the design all the way and, and let it out to the contractors to bid. Um, they're working on the, what that price would be along the way. So we have a good idea towards the end of design what it's going to cost us to build. We should, we should know what it's going to cost at that point. Um, the contract, uh, at that point, we may sign a contract with this um, construction firm, the, with the construction manager, general contracted firm, um, on that guaranteed maximum price uh, to complete the work, or that work may go to other contractors um, uh, depending on how the negotiations on that GMP would go. So historical perspective, some of this you may already be aware of. So we signed a design contract with JUB engineers in uh, September of last year. Uh, in January, we um, did a, a qualifications-based interview process with several CMGC firms to determine the most qualified CMGC as we saw it. Um, we're seeking a contract agreement with that CMGC firm today, and we would pretty soon, right away, have a, a kickoff workshop um, with all of them, JUB, the city, and McMillan Jacobs, um, to, to start that next set of design. <laughs> so they're the final design we're looking for uh, by August of this year, and there are some milestones at 60% design and 95% design. Um, looking for construction in the low water year, low water season of next summer. So the contract with McMillan Jacobs, it's a contract between the city and McMillan Jacobs, um, but it lays out the responsibilities of each party. So JEB knows what they're responsible for. 
McMillan Jacobs would know what they were responsible for, and the city of Post Falls, we have our own responsibilities. Uh, so the value of that contract is $116,204, and that does include a 10% contingency. I would just like to say that uh, Councilor Malloy did text me and said he had some questions on it, <clears throat> but he hadn't read all the details. Uh, he was going to do that, uh, so he may be contacting you if he does have additional questions. Okay. Just, just to make you aware. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this? No, go ahead. In the staff report that we received, it said that the scope is not to exceed 105,640. Correct. So the and then there is a 10% contingency on that. But the slide you just showed us at 116,204 includes a contingency. Oh, that includes the. That contingency. includes the contingency. Okay, that, that adds up. Yeah. Okay. Very good. No <laughs> other questions. Thanks, Craig. Any other questions? We do need uh, action on this tonight. I'd move to approve the construction manager, general manager service agreement with <clears throat> McMillan Jacobs for the outfall and river crossing. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Shannon, please take the roll. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thanks for the information. Uh, next item on the agenda is citizens issue and this section of the agenda is reserved for citizens wishing to address the council regarding a city related issue that is not on the agenda and if anyone wants to speak to the council on a non agenda item please come forward seeing no takers next item up is ordinance ordinances and resolutions we have not new, none. Business. Oh. new business why am I missing that <laughs> Those glasses on there. Brian was getting ready to come up and sat right back down. <laughs> He's leaving you out, Brian. I, yeah. I'm going to need to make my font bigger, I think. So I apologize. I'm just glad you guys keep me in line. That's a full time. Are your glasses stronger? Yeah, one of the two. <laughs> Next item actually is new business. I was just kidding before. <laughs> and tonight it's the Water Lantern Festival contract for the use of Camellum Park. Mayor, Council, thank you. And today, tonight we're presenting a request for consideration of a special event agreement for a water lantern festival uh, to take place in Camila Park and the selected date is September 7th. Um, we looked originally at the second weekend in May and that date or they re initially requested that second weekend in May and that conflicted with our downtown for a day event that we're hosting as a city so we steered them towards another event where we typically start to see uh, activity in the park begin to die off. We still have decent traffic, but looking for another activity time that we can uh, spur the public into, into a space that's a little less utilized. Uh, so Water Lantern Festival is uh, an event that aims to gather the community in kind of a unique setting that we don't really see in our, in our region. Uh, I'm gonna play a short video here uh, that kind of gives the essence of, of what this event will be.
So the event proponent, as you can see by the video, uh, they're practiced at this and they do these things throughout the, throughout the nation and across the world. Uh, they've hosted over a million people in similar types of events throughout n numerous communities. Uh, they select local vendors and food trucks and such um, to be able to support the activities of, of those that are ac attending their activity. They also do reach out to local businesses for sponsorship and advertising purposes. Uh, so pictures similar to what we do for our Post Falls Festival. Uh, the footprint that they're, they're requesting is very similar to what we utilize for Post Falls Festival. Uh, so it is an extensive event, a uh, fairly large footprint, uh, but a shorter time frame as far as the event goes. They sell these lantern kits. That's the main product that is associated with this. Uh, you can purchase these ahead of time or day of the event. <coughs> the pricing changes as it nears closer to the event. Um, each kit comes with a floating lantern, uh, some little bag to carry it all in, uh, and then a wristband to enter the launch area. So that is the only area that's closed off to the public. The general event is open to the public to mill around and, and engage with the community. All other. So the only area that is closed is that, that place where you enter the water to launch your, launch your lantern. The gates open three hours before sunset, so the event generally is about a five hour long event. Um, the guests have a vil the availability of the food trucks and music, uh, other vendors al along site. That lantern decorating comes in that same period of time up until the launch window opens um, at sunset and the event, the release of the lanterns lasts about an hour. Um, everything wraps up two hours after and then they begin doing their cleanup. What this looks like for our city staff, uh, event staging the day before, helping the proponent and, other vendor, and their vendors to gain access to the site and safely move it around. Uh, there'll be some disruption to the general public in utilizing, utilizing Camelon Park for that day, so the Friday before. Uh, they will bring in their own security staff, security staff uh, to be present in the park overnight. That next morning, uh, vendors will be moving in. Once again, city staff will be overseeing that process. Uh, the event's open to the public at 5 p.m. and we will be monitoring the event and whatever sound system they have set up, either with live music or a DJ. And then they, the event happens. Um, event closes down about 10 p.m and they start their cleanup process that runs through the evening and then the following morning they do a walkthrough with us and by noon the event should be or the park should be back to the normal operation uh, they have a strong goal to leave the facility in a better condition than what they received at the day before uh, which is appealing um, and as our discussion was two weeks ago we added a few things into the that basis of a contract to, to try to secure that even better for, for the city to, to help um, offset any potential offset of costs. The contract before you is a one-year term with an option for two one-year extensions. Uh, the use fee of $3,000 plus 10% of the cut of any event that's larger than 2,000 lanterns. We have a event review and layout 45 days prior to the event that'll include city staff and other agencies that may uh, have weigh in on on the way this event would happen including the PD and KCFR. Uh, a damage deposit will be placed uh, in, in city funds uh, in the amount of $500 45 days prior to the event so that's an element that we've added to this contract that wasn't before you in, with a similar event two weeks ago. Um, Setup begins the day prior at 8 a.m. and then the park is back to normal noon the, the day after the event. Uh, we did add some sound level considerations that you'll see in the, in the agenda that allowed us to do that monitoring and adjustment if we do find complaints. Uh, fire protection requirements through KCFR for that mobile vending and, and portable tents. Additional off-site parking considerations are to be made and they've already reached out to some local uh, landowners that help that will should be able to hold uh, any additional parking that the park can't accommodate and then there's uh, some 
general boilerplate language regarding cancellation from either party's stance uh, and general liability considerations. With that, stand for questions. Ryan, so if they're going to launch it at the boat, boat launch, is that correct? So it'll be from the swim area. So generally the east side of our swim area. So will it, will it be contained in the swim area then, the lanterns? That's correct. I pictured them getting over the safe oh, buoy going over the, the dam. So <laughs> yep. Yes. So yeah, it's, as it's they described rolling. the event, they have kayaks out in the water uh, with a second buoy line basically helping to contain the area and contain those lanterns so they can retrieve them at the end of the event. Okay. You know, I didn't see David Fair, but there was something in Pulse Falls, late 90s, early 2000s, at Falls Park. Okay. Uh, on a much smaller scale, obviously, because the pond at Falls Park, and I think Allie Shoot was involved with it, so it had something to do. But yeah, it was not on the uh, wooden platform, that lit quite a bit, they were just floated out there. But it just was lovely, it was, it's kind of like the lanterns they do in the sky. And I think that the, the people that it would draw, uh, yeah, I, I think that the demographic of the people that would be drawn to this are the kind of people that you'd want in the park. So, yeah, I, I don't see a downside to it. No, I think personally it's a good event uh, in the season. Yeah. Mr. Wolf? Sounds like a great event. Did we reach out to any other cities that have hosted this to find out if they they follow through like they say they'll follow through? They provide a long list, list of references. Uh, we didn't reach out to anybody, but I know Boise is holding one of these events. Um, so that, that's the extent of this okay. at this point. Um, Brian, so if I'm meant to understand this right, um, you, the park is going to be closed the day before, the day of until 5 o'clock, and then the following day until around noon? It wouldn't be closed. The, the park will be impacted by vendors moving about and setting up. So it's not a closed event. The park is open to the general public. We'll just have to be there on site monitoring as, as they move around and, and get their event deployed. Similar to what it is for Post Falls Festival on the Tuesday, Wednesday ahead of, or oh, Wednesday, see. Thursday ahead of our event. I see. Friday. Yeah, I think it would just be really, really nice. I just had a question. Is this, uh, Vendor the same one that does the Lantern Festival in Spokane or a different one now? This is different. Okay. Yep. This one's different. They're based out of Utah. Um, and the, the coordinator on this has been extremely responsive. Uh, communication's been excellent. Okay. So that, that's a positive sign at the, the lead in. Okay. Good event. Need an action uh, vote on this? It doesn't say action item, but we do need one, correct? Yes, we're approving the contract. Oh. Uh, I'd make a discussion? motion. No, no, no. Okay. Go, DJ. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd make a motion to approve the waterless water lantern festival contract for the use at Camelon Park. Second. second. Motion seconds for the discussion. Roll call, please. Porters? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Brian. Next item up is now ordinances and resolutions, and lo and behold, we still don't have any. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Followed by administrative staff reports. Uh, I asked to have a update on the snowplow. We've had emails, we've had uh, uh, phone calls with concerns, uh, some complaints. We've had very many that have been positive and thankful. Uh, Councilor Malloy asked some very good questions. Um, you know, the, the, my thought is we're getting used to the snow gates. We knew it was going to take longer. We had back-to-back -back snow events. I mean, if it could go wrong, it did. And so we're, we're catching up. And, and, you know, we know I feel we do a great job. And I think improvements can always be made. And, and so I'd ask for an update. And uh, John's going to pinch mm -hmm. in for Paul. <laughs> is Paul out on a plow awesome. right now? He's probably on a plow, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. I, I would say that I emailed Paul on several occasions over the last week, and he would respond and says, well, I'm heading back out. Oh, yeah. Now, and I will be back, so. Yeah, he's been running a loader. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about snow operations. <laughs> As the <laughs> mayor mentioned, I am pitch hitting. Um, I've seen this presentation for 
probably a total of an hour today. <laughs> so Paul provided a lot of notes. I'm going to be going through those, but feel free to stop me if I'm uh, not making sense and need to clarify something. And with that, I'll launch into it. I, uh, like I say, feel free to stop me at any point. The goal, as the mayor mentioned, is to go through some of what the plan was, how that's worked, things we've learned, and kind of where we're going in the future. Um, our snow operations plan, if you'd like to read it, is located on the city's website. And the gist of it is we have three levels of, it's really four when you dive into it, but three levels of routes. Our priority one routes, those are your Celtis Way or your Spokane Street. Our priority two routes are your smaller roads, uh, not major arterials, but like Ponderosa is a good example of that, or Third Street. And then uh, kind of the remainder are residential streets. And within residential streets are cul-de-sacs. So that is the order in which our plan is to plow those. And um, obviously first hit priority one routes, then priority two, then going to go into residentials. Uh, this is where one of our first lessons learned was, but our plan going into the year was if the main roads, the priority one routes deteriorated, we'd pull out of the residential areas and dust those up again, go back to residential plowing and basically keep the mains uh, well plowed for the year. Uh, because cul-de-sacs are a time consuming process, it's just a lot more difficult to plow a cul-de-sac. Uh, crews go through that part of the residential neighborhoods last after they've plowed the sort of through streets. We have made a pretty big effort to increase our outreach to the community about that plan. Um, probably the most visible place is on our city's Facebook page. And um, as the mayor noted, we've received a lot of comments, uh, positive and negative, on that page. Take them pretty seriously and, and try to learn from the negative, but appreciate the positive comments as well. Um, it's worth a thank you to our media department for helping with that effort. Uh, they are responsible for the posts, so we are sending them content and they are posting that on the city's webpage at sort of all hours of the day. And then it's not in Paul's notes, but I will say Paul has also been responding to those personally, uh, again, at all hours of the day. And we've been trying to be more proactive to those comments so folks know they're being heard. Uh, we do have a email that people can write to. It goes to all of our street supervisors day and night. And it just forwards to all of them automatically, and that is snow worries at postfallsidaho.org. So that's sort of been our internal method for passing concerns along as well, just because it does hit that many people. And we're experimenting with some other outreach items just to talk about what is in the plan. Uh, for an example, we recently attended a Q&A at the Post Falls Senior Center. I'm just trying to <coughs> broaden our outreach. We had a mailer that went out with our, or a, a note that was included with our utility bills that are mailed out as well. Um, talk a little bit about the snow gates and the level of service. Um, right. We're just kind of walking through these, so there's not much uh, <laughs> to show you yet. I do have some pictures later on. We'll walk through. <laughs> um, um, obviously, the snow gates have been a bit of a challenging rollout. Some of that is the fact that you can't practice plowing snow until you have snow. So we have great operators, but uh, at the same time, they need a little bit of seat time to kind of get the sense of how that works. And additionally, they work best in about two to four inches. That's where they can really do a good job of uh, carrying the snow through a driveway without building up too much to carry. Um, we did see a increase in plow times. Our previous plow times were in the 12 to 14 hour range for the whole city. This recent uh, series of storms, the first plow from start to completion was over 36 hours, so a pretty substantial increase in plow times. There's some reasons for that, too. Uh, would like to mention within our residential plow plan, we don't just uh, plow the residents willy-nilly throughout the city. Basically start on the edges of the city and work in toward the center. I've got a map I'll show you. Uh, might as well pull that up now. <coughs> oh, you're going to see all the... I'll come back to it as we go through. Uh, we have four quadrants of the city. We plow each quadrant from the outside to the center of the city. 
that doesn't mean that they exactly land on Idaho in each case. In the southern part of the city, it's Greens Ferry. So uh, it's worth looking that map up on our website. You can see exactly which quadrant you fall in and get a sense as we go from either east to west or west to east where you fall in that. And what we're trying to do there is just have a repeatable plowing experience, so to speak, where if you're midway through, you know that once we hit residential neighborhoods, you're going to be about midway through the plow. Um, on the east side of the city, we do have a higher elevation area in the highlands, so hitting that east side of the city first also helps with their, what they actually see additional snow in the highlands. Any questions while I refer to my notes? <laughs> so I mentioned we had some lessons learned with uh, maintaining the priority one routes instead of residential neighborhoods. And what we found was we would spend six hours plowing residential neighborhoods. The priority routes would deteriorate and we'd pull out of that neighborhood and go back, which was a pretty frustrating experience to the citizens. Um, folks saw that residential roads were being plowed and then their road wasn't plowed within a X number of hours. Um, we were following the plan as we had written it, but we're realizing that what we need to do is once we start that residential plowing effort, see it through for the whole city. And if the mains deteriorate somewhat in that time period, we'll look for any additional staff that we're able to borrow from other departments, bring them in, but generally we'll make that commitment to finish the residential routes once we get started. Question on that for you. Yes. So do we use the snow gates on the priority routes as well? Generally, no. Okay. Uh, there, there are some areas where that might be an exception, but generally those routes don't have the same driveways. And, uh. Okay, the second question I have for you is, uh, what is a 12-hour shift's maximum that our drivers can plow? Um, I don't know if there's a legal limit on that, but 12 hours is what we okay. cut folks off So on. we've got guys, maybe, maybe some women as well, but we've got people driving these snow plows for 12 hours at a time. Correct. Uh, I received an email from someone that says she was awakened at 3.15 by the snowplow. And she was so excited, she, in her pajamas, jumped in the car and went and, f and found him and held up a thank you sign. <laughs> because it was 3.15, <laughs> she's in her warm house, in her bed, and they're out plowing. So they're, they're doing a good job. Question I have, is there, ex is there equipment that might sit vacant, uh, uh, not being used? So while we're out plowing the streets, is there additional equipment with plows that uh, is available if we had additional people to drive? I'll say generally, yes. Okay. Um, part of the reason for that is we leased four loaders with snow gates to begin this program, and we still have loaders that we own that are um, further on in life and don't have snow gates. So those loaders are available or our snowplow trucks are available. We have enough staff to staff two shifts of eight operators each. Uh, plus some fill-in staff. So. But if there's extra equipment available, you're not going to let one of us get on them and plow the snow, right? I was just going to say, I think the mayor is volunteering <laughs> <laughs> services here. We have a sign-up sheet too. here at the end. I'll just circulate that around. <clears throat> well, John's looking. Part of the reason for that is we used to send all of our drivers out at once. And now we're doing two shifts, so we're kind of splitting them. So we had more trucks than we now are using because we're running two shifts. So we used to run the 12 hours. We'd give everybody 12 hours off. What we found is during that 12 hours, if we had continual snow, was then you had 12 hours of the city not being plowed. And there's a trade-off. You know, fewer numbers plowing at once continuously versus 12 hours of higher number than 12 hours off. Well, and so one of the reasons I ask that question on equipment is if in fact you did have qualified and or trained staff who could uh, you know you're running eight people at a time if there's additional equipment and there is staff available in a bad situation we could theoretically bring bring or call those folks in to jump on the plows right and, and John and Paul are having those yeah. discussions about having kind of reserve backup. people that would be back up I will say uh, there were no available staff to operate equipment in the past storm. Do you have um, your CDL? We, we had, I do not have a CDL actually. Uh, <laughs> Don't get one. We had our regular shifts of eight and then we were supplementing that with uh, staff from the water department, the wastewater department, parks department, um, basically anybody uh, willing and able to do that work. Sure. So. 
John, I have my motorcycle endorsement if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please put my name on if you plow get behind the plow. <laughs> And I should say, uh, I want to add to that. So those additional staff um, were on board while we had teams out plowing the residential neighborhoods the second time. And those staff were maintaining the main arterials with the use of our uh, dump trucks that have the snow plows on the front. Uh, what we did learn is that in a normal, snow, normal snowfall, uh, our street team can clear the residential streets in about 24 hours. That's now that they're used to the equipment and uh, generally agreeable conditions, which is what we saw the second, uh, second residential plow that we did. Um, some numbers for you. We've spent about $64,000 on magnesium chloride this year. 21,000 of that, so just under a third, um, has been since February 1st, which is not quite three weeks. Uh, similarly, our staff have spent um, 2,609 hours actually plowing snow. And of that, 12, um, 1,286, which is not quite half, have been since February 1st. So we have put a lot of hours on those machines just in the last three weeks. Um, obviously, one lesson learned is that we need to focus resources on our priority routes once the residential plowing begins. Um, the, we saw tandem frustrations. Uh, we saw folks frustrated that we were plowing residentials and not maintaining the priority one routes as we had said we were going to do, and folks frustrated that we hadn't plowed the residential routes yet and we were out maintaining the priority one routes. So um, our compromise on that going forward is finish the residential routes, pull in any staff that we can that are available to clean up the main routes. Um, it would be helpful to have a better system of notifying citizens where our snow plows are. We're working with that on our Facebook page to just provide more narrative updates. They're this far through this quadrant, um, working east to west. Um, we'll try to keep improving on that. We're also looking at potentially use, utilizing software in the future to do that with um, basically GPS tracking devices. Um, there are some logistical problems associated with that. Um, Obviously, and we put this in almost all the messages we sent out, cars parked on the side of the road and trash cans left out on the side of the road for extended periods of time really slow the plows down. So anytime we can send that message out, we're happy to do that. Uh, we did have some accomplishments. I had a, a concerned citizen with some valid concerns ask me not to declare this operation a success. We'll say we had some successes in this operation. Our priority one routes, uh, like on Celtis Way, um, Spokane Street, look good still. Um, there's bare pavement in a lot of places. Um, we did receive positive Facebook messages and positive phone messages as well, positive emails. Um, not all of them are positive, and we're going to call that a success too. Folks are talking to us, telling us what they'd like to see differently, and it's our job to make a recommendation from that. And then. Uh, it's not tongue in cheek, I really think this is a success. Had we not had the February we've had, we would not know how our snow plan functioned as it was written in October. So having the mild November, December, January we had didn't serve our plan well. This February has done a great job of providing some constructive wow. criticism for us. Good spin. <laughs> With that, here are the pictures of the snow gates, as you got the preview for a second ago. Uh, they're just a hydraulic device that operates on the end of the plow, up and down. That's pretty much all the control you have. And um, as it's been noted a couple times, it takes some time to learn how to operate that well. I think the staff have done a great job figuring that out. That being said, uh, we've had our struggles with it. Uh, hit a driveway and miss a driveway. There's a learning curve. And um, I, I, my hat's off to the staff for uh, taking on that learning curve. There have been hiccups, and we're working through those. really curious what happens next. <laughs> you hope it's good. We talked a little bit about this already, but the shifts are six to six. It doesn't matter which shift you're on, that's the hours you start. And I should note we've had five guys who volunteered to stay on the night shift um, all year round, or not year round, but through the snow season. Uh, we maintain the 572 miles of, uh, lane miles of road 
you can do the math for how many miles that is per employee on duty. It's also worth noting there was a reason that we recommended this change last fall and that was that our snow berm reduction program where you ask us to come back and knock the berm down after the fact seeing a dramatic increase uh, we saw 38 percent increase from 17 to 18 but we expected that to basically skyrocket to where a lot of the driveways i don't know what percentage let's say half the driveways were in that program um, with the snow gates once we get it staffed and equipment the way that we're hoping to um, it's a scalable thing so the level of service we can see it at this population level or this development level if that changes um, sort of changes proportionally we don't see an increase necessarily in uh, in response time as you would if you see this snow berm reduction program accelerate um, this is worth noting the the 24-hour shifts like Shelly mentioned are also a financial benefit to the city. Previously, we had um, the call-out plan, basically. Once it starts snowing, everybody stays until they've worked their allotted hours, and they come back as soon as they can. Lots of times on overtime, um, that adds up in terms of expense to the city. This has staff on duty basically 24 hours a day, um, at least five days a week. So we're not paying overtime necessarily to have folks out there keeping the roads clear at night. Sorry, it's kind of a long presentation, but there's a lot to cover. So, so we talked about um, challenges. On-street parking has been uh, a challenge for us, um, something that we're evaluating alternatives to help address. I know the PD has been helpful in cases where it rises to that level, but uh, we haven't had a, a massive tow-off program this year either, um, as some folks have requested. Uh, trash bins are a challenge. Uh, we realize folks have to put their trash bins out to get the trash hauled off. So our request is, if possible, wait until the morning of pickup day, put it out there, and then as soon as you can afterward, pull it back in. Um, there's, if folks did that, there's a good chance they would miss the snow plow. It just wouldn't line up right. So uh, it's worth noting that. Um, Equipment breakdowns are inevitable. So we have four loaders with snow gates for four quadrants of the city, and we're trying to get a snow gate to every residence. So that means if one of those loaders has an issue, um, there's a challenge in delivering that level of service. What our guys have been doing is they go through and they basically plow a street and then come back through and remove the snow berm from the driveways. We're trying to follow through on our commitment not to make berms, even if we have, in one case, a major hydraulic cylinder failed on a loader and you can't run it for the day. So, Talked a little bit about why did it take so long. Um, basically, it was a, a scheduling challenge. Uh, we had a lot of snow falling in a short amount of time. So choosing which roads to plow meant some other roads weren't getting plowed. Uh, we think we've got a better scheduling plan put in place for the next storm. Um, drifts are also worth worth mentioning. That's not something that uh, we talk about a lot, but they were a major factor in this last storm. Uh, I know once the storm was over, everything was plowed, and then you come back a few hours later, and uh, I know there's a good picture in here of a snow drift, and the road's covered again. So um, that was basically a, a dress as needed, but it took a lot of time and, and rework, basically. Uh, there's a question here, will this be the new norm? Uh, I'll read what Paul's written here. In short, the answer is no. Uh, there's uh, this idea of dedicating resources to the priority one routes by pulling those in where we can and then committing to residential routes. We've also um, hopefully climbed that learning curve quite a ways in terms of operations. Um, it just, like I said, takes some seat time to get used to the plows. So hopefully as this uh, effort continues, uh, we just get faster at it. And then as noted earlier, in a normal snow event, uh, normal, we were able to plow the residential neighborhoods in about 24 hours. So we had originally said we thought about 30 hours for total citywide plow. That seems to be about right once we get things dialed in. Here is a snow drift. Um, for comparison, that snow plow blade comes up 
to the top of my leg somewhere. So you see it's not something you can drive through. The note here says this was just one of the snow drifts that we were challenged with. Uh, here's an example of parking and uh, just a challenge to plow around. And even if you do a good job, there's still snow that's out in the road and kind of makes a mess. Uh, some trash day pictures. That's nice. Cul-de-sacs, challenging to begin with, but uh, extra challenging with vehicles in the cul-de-sacs. Uh, Councillor Malloy actually sent us a pretty funny email about uh, witnessing somebody uh, watching plowing operations happen around their cul-de-sacs so with, with their car in the driveway. He did point out it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I didn't show him that. <clears throat> As promised, here is our snow removal quadrant map. Uh, quadrants because they're equally weighted in area roughly, or at least in lane miles, but they're not very square shaped. So uh, you can see the dividing line is about Idaho in the northern part of the city. And as you go south, it's Greens Ferry, and then it's Celtis along kind of the middle. So. And once we get into residential neighborhoods, this goes basically from the outside in, as I mentioned. Uh, we do, this is also worth mentioning, another challenge, um, we do prohibit putting snow from not in the right-of-way into the right-of-way. That just makes things worse for everybody. So um, we've taken a pretty proactive approach in terms of the streets team reaching out to people that they see doing this. We've also had great support from the PD in uh, trying to enforce that when we're able to put everybody in the same location at the same time. So please don't put your snow in the right of way. That's my request to the public. Um, John, I if I could take you one more second, I would really like to thank the staff. And I, I made a list, so I would try not to forget anybody, but it's basically everybody at the city. Um, police department obviously has been helpful. Um, traffic control sort of things, uh, helping with enforcement. I mentioned the media center. I also want to mention the admin staff. I know a lot of folks answer questions who aren't on the snow hotline, but their phone rings at City Hall. They do their best to take care of folks and pass it along to the streets team. The water parks and wastewater staff who filled in sort of above and beyond their normal duties. And then the street staff really deserve um, some thanks. Um, it's in the presentation, but they work 12, 12 hour shifts in a row, which is an astronomical amount of time. With that, any questions? I'd just like to thank you for stepping in for Paul. I'd like to thank Paul because I've had uh, numerous emails, and a lot of times people just want to make their concerns known, and then it's nice to get the follow-up emails thanking uh, the uh, city for addressing it or you know, uh, trying to take care of it. Uh, I know that it's not been easy. It's been a, a real challenge. It's a learning experience. And again, I know Paul has been responding. Anytime I email him, and I try to copy Shelley, but it could be, Weekends, it's evenings, it's more whenever, and he's when he has the opportunity. As soon as he has the opportunity, he's getting back to those people. And and again, most of them have been uh, extremely uh, courteous. You know, they address their concerns, they bring them forward, and they appreciate the response. Uh, I've have had a few people that say, you know, you guys won't spend the money to keep our streets clean. And I think back to the number of hours that you mentioned, the number we've uh, the dollar amount we spent on the icer and. Uh, although we live by a pretty strict budget, that does not constrain our ability and or willingness to keep our streets clean. So I think it's going to improve as we go forward. I appreciate the fact that you're looking at other options and, and you've got a plan and if it's, oftentimes it's going to need tweaked and that sounds like that's what you're doing. I've told folks that, you know, there's no public testimony tonight, but if they have questions that uh, you or myself would be available after the meeting. So if someone uh, does come up to address it with you, that's, that's why. But we want to make sure we get questions answered. So. Wonderful. And um, feel free to reach out to us through phone or email or the Snow Worries email as well. Sounds good. Not here tonight. Any council comments? I have thank one, you. Mayor, about that. Um, I, I would just like to thank the city staff as well. Um, and uh, in January, Paul was actually praying for snow, and we got an email um, about that. And just to let him know wherever he is tonight, it's snowing again, Paul. Um, but I think that everybody 
really <coughs> joining together and working together and just like you stepping in tonight everybody shows such a good attitude and I think the citizens really do appreciate that too so thank you thank you I was just gonna say that I think I'm one of the worst case scenarios in that I think my street my subdivision is now at the latter end of getting so all my neighbors you know now all of a sudden it's like where's the city where's you know what's going on we used to be plowed by this time in a storm but I guarantee you one thing when we when the plows came through the other night and we got up the next morning and there was no berm nice. like hallelujah awesome. time it was like everybody was happy so I think it's one of those things the reason I make that comment is I think it's one of those things that as people kind of get used to the way it's going to be done they're going to be really happy and I was more of a I was on the outside of the snow gates because I'm still healthy enough to go out and clear my own berm but I, I really do like what's going on I, I, I appreciate what everybody's doing and and as everybody said just the fact that you're listening and and uh, making tweaks to the plan I think that's awesome great job John well, I had a, an original concern being on the, the committee uh, on the snow gates that we were going to invest all this money into uh, front end loaders and snow gates and not get a chance to use them. But uh, just a little bit more than what I expected. So, But uh, same thing as what Al said, uh, our neighborhood that some of the neighbors would throw their hands up in the air and say, where's the plows? But once I explained to them, you're not going to have berms when you wake up in the morning. You're, when they plow it and that goes a long ways they had a lot of smiling faces the next day when they didn't have to show off those berms to go to work so I uh, would just want to echo everybody great they've done a great job there is a learning curve and I think they picked on pretty quick I better I better give a thank you on behalf of my husband Bert says thank you for no berms <laughs> I don't shovel berms so it didn't impact me <laughs> but he has been incredibly grateful this month so there you go pass that along so thanks again john appreciate it thank you for your feedback uh, it's appreciated yep. Yep. next item up is mayor comments and i just want to follow up on that letter i read about our police department parks department stepping up to help out you know i have the opportunity to visit with Coeur d'Alene's mayor quite frequently and one of the things that I always just kind of scratch my head about is when people say, you know, we've driven the streets in Pulse Falls this time of year and they're terrible and Coeur d'Alene is perfect and Spokane streets are perfect. And then you read about what's going on in Spokane. I drive Coeur d'Alene streets every day and I'll put our efforts up with anybody and we're doing a good job. There are some hiccups. We'll improve it. Uh, but our goal is to provide the, the best service and it goes outside. It's not just tied to the street uh, streets department and snow plowing but it's to all the departments the way they work together uh, the way they get involved uh, again I hear thank you from other cities for the for the assistance that our staff has provided and, and uh, I mean I'm proud to be part of this community so for the whole staff Shelley all of you uh, you know it really is a, an honor to be associated with you because we do do a good job and we're also not looking through uh, rose-colored glasses and know that improvements can be made and the fact is we take those steps to improve them so thank you very much um, council comments I'd just like to comment on the fact that I understand that our chief of police was even out plowing snow he said we didn't put a plow on the front of his car, did we? <laughs> no, I think he's got a gator or something. I jumped in the rhino one day when I uh, had a couple hours of downtime, and I said I could just sit at my desk and answer some numbers, or I could go out and make a difference. So I went out and helped some people that were shoveling their driveways. Good for you. Thank That's you very much. Good. Awesome. Thanks, Chief. Okay. At 30 minutes ago, Post Falls Trojans and Coeur d'Alene Vikings began the championship game for the regional championships for a birth to state. Just in case anybody wants to place any bets. And I will be driving there as soon as the meeting's over. <laughs> so the speed do, limit. Do you have an escort? Saying. Yeah. <laughs> an escort, flashing lights. Uh, we do not need an executive session tonight. We do not. So the next motion is? Move to adjourn. adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.